Welcome everyone. So this is a panel discussion on ethics. It's like a really small word for a thing that covers, I think, really big problems. And um, yeah, I think in the in the 1940s, Norbert Wiener was the first person to start to hint that there could be problems around ethics and computers in, in 1948 uh, when he wrote a book called Cybernetics. And then it, it gets quite quiet until about the 1980s and suddenly issues around ethics and information and decision sciences and computers start to pick up again, largely around the time that the personal computer starts to become popular and also the rise of the internet. So I think one of the things we can ask ourselves is, does the R community have an ethical problem? And that's a question we can ask to our panel, but in a broader sense, does the, does the computer science, you know, the data science people, uh, people working in decision theory, do they, do they have an ethical problem? Do, do we have an ethical problem in, in the field of computer science and information technology as a whole? <coughs> And if you look at the, at the industry at the moment, it seems like it, that there is a bit of a problem. Like we're not quite able to address certain, the consequences of some of the technology that's being developed. Like the te our technology is racing ahead of, of how we understand it and how we regulate it. So I think um, we've got quite a diverse panel here, which is quite nice. And uh, let's, let's see what, what you guys have to say. I'll start, I'll start with the first question, and that's maybe, um, I can start with you, Peter. Um, oh, I'll start with Rob, because he's got them. <laughs> um, so, um, no, sorry, my name's David Clark, by the way. I'm sure of transparency, <laughs> so I can say who I am. Um, I'm the director of Chalcid, and I'm also the Joburg Chapter Chair of the Operations Research Society. So, um, Rob, I think, and for the rest of the panel, let's just start with maybe what you feel is a concern when it comes to um, ethics and, and, and some of the, the consequences that, that, that can you know, follow on from decisions that we make as, as people that work in the decision science field or visualizing data you know, and using data that, that we have access to. Um, I haven't had very long to think about this topic, um, to be honest, as I'm sure many of you haven't, because often uh, I think we're plunged into this need of um, having to deliver results for people to consume, and you don't really think about the, the full chain of custody around data or what the, why the implications could be, because the emphasis is normally on, like, well, let's understand this problem, or how can we do ABC better. Um, but I think um, from a concern point of view, I mean, for me, it's always about where does the liability rest, right? So we see all these regulations around, um, you, you could think of it uh, like gun control for data, right? So uh, basically, um, things like GDPR is a way of trying to enforce particular standards around how we protect information. So that is very good. We've got the Puppy Act around how we uh, protect people's private information. My favorite current pastime is when someone calls me to sell me product ABC, I say, oh, sorry, where did you get my information from? And then they say, oh, oh well, we, have, we have multiple channels that we get our data from. I'm like, yeah, yes, you have to tell me where you got it from. And then I'd like to know where they got it from because those people weren't allowed to give it to me, you in the first place. So um, I think we're, we're sort of becoming more educated as a population. Um, and I think maybe from my perspective, I think a lot of the liability is currently resting on the people who are using the data um, as sort of people who consume data for some sort of bigger purpose. Um, but not much of the liability has yet been passed on to the individuals. You know, like, what lengths do you, as people in this room, go to to protect your personal information? Um, do you know what your rights and responsibility are around data? Because uh, you are contributing to the problem. Um, I have a nice anecdote around this. Can I share it? Um, no, <laughs> I won't. Save it for later. <laughs> so, but, but that's my I, 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 I personally blame everyone else in this room for the ethics problem. I don't think it's the practitioner's problem. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, I, I guess I come from a psychology background, and a lot of the problems I run into are when I think about the intersection with AI and computer science, things like that, come stem from the origins of the data that we are using and what it was originally collected for. So almost every time we train up a model, whether it be a deep learning model, even simple linear regression, doesn't actually matter all that much. 
we're making some assumptions about the origin of the data and whether or not it's relevant to the context that we want to apply it. And almost every single time I've dealt with real world data rather than you know, cutesy little things I just made up for a psychology experiment, the data is never quite fit for purpose. Like I collected it to do one thing or because it was convenient or it had some desirable pro properties that made it accessible to me in the first place. But the problem I want to solve using that data is not always the same thing. And so because you get that kind of context drift, um, the model doesn't capture that shift in goal. And so a thing where, to, to give a concrete example of one that I saw fall over in my own work quite recently was we collected this large data set called the Small World of Words uh, data set, and I think it's sort of been written up in a few places outside of psychology. But roughly, it's this, you know, it's a, for psychology, it's a large data set. There's responses by about 90,000 people, you know, about 4 million responses, where you just ask people simple questions like, uh, what's the first word that comes to mind when I say cat? And most people think dog, and they'll respond with that. But you repeat this on a very large scale for a large number of words across many languages. And you can use this to say something interesting about the structure of different languages and the representations that people have in it. From my scientific, you know, the sort of stuff I care about, yeah, this is fun, this is awesome, I really like this data, I'm quite proud of it. Um, I just wish I had actually done any of the real work in, uh, in collecting it. It was all done by the postdocs involved. Um, but one thing we found when you start digging into the structure of the data is, well, it encodes a whole lot of biases that people have about the world, like, and not, not all of these are good biases, like some of these are um, sexist biases, some of them are racist biases, those things are there in our data set because they're there in the language. So if I then take that data and use it to build a sentiment classifier, let's say, or some other use that's not the simple word association <laughs> context that we collected the data in, I'm now importing all of those biases into my classifier. And I can't control that unless I've got good models or good theories about what changed when I moved from, say, this word association context to data classification, or the sentiment classification. If I don't know that, I can't solve my ethical problem. I know that I've got it, but I don't know how to control for it. And I think that's one of the big issues that we're facing. Like, we know that we have an issue, but we're not quite sure how to handle that context shift. That's my thing. Hi, I'm Lubash from Rain. Um, so the comments that I make here is not on behalf of my company, it's on behalf of myself. <laughs> I'm just with that. Um, so I worry from two perspectives. One, as a, as a consumer, or as a person that's putting out data, uh, I don't know if you guys saw, like a while back, an artist did this uh, printout of the legalese of Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook, and it went down the wall. So the actual terms and conditions that we sign when we sign up for something like that is running down the wall. So just think about how much information is in there that we don't read. So I think about it that way, that as a, user, as a person who's putting out data there, what can they use it for that I just glossed over the, the terms and conditions and said, okay, I'm fine that you use my data, but what am I like signing into? And I also think about it from a, as a data scientist, what unconscious bias does my data have in it? What unconscious bias do I have? Because we're all human and we all actually have bias through. I think it's ingrained in us. And what if I bring that to the models that I'm actually putting out there? Thanks, Steve. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Peter Coleman uh, from Blitz University. Um, my perspective on ethics is coming from the academic research side. Um, and there, we are very constrained in what we can do. Um, before you like to collect any data from anybody, you have to get ethical clearance for the data. You're not allowed to use people's data beyond what you they signed up for. Um, you have to, to release their data. You have to have their permission to release the data. And that's in an anonymized form as well. So it always amazes me when you get all these freely available data sets with human data in it. 
because um, I very much doubt any of those asked um, permission for the release of those data. Um, you've got, there's lots of data sets in R itself where it's about cancer, it's about um, there's lung disease, there's all manner of standard data sets. Those are co collected on real people. You probably didn't consent for that data to be collected and distributed somewhere. Um, so where I'm working at, at a situation where we need um, explicit permission to use data, collect and use data, there are a lot of data out there where that is not so. Um, and the question is where is, what do we do in those circumstances? I use those data for teaching purposes, um, so I'm guilty um, of using data which necessarily wasn't necessarily collected ethically. Um, so that's my perspective. Um, I feel kind of a bit of pressure to go last. <laughs> so I was like, please, nobody must make the point I want to make. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Reza Nanga. and I uh, have a bit of a different background. So I've worked as a journalist um, and I have sort of a history background. So I'm sort of speaking from that kind of perspective. And I think, although it might sound weird, I think data science can learn a lot from history writing. So there was this guy, obviously it was a guy, because it was 60 years ago, um, who said, who made this super radical point then, that history writing is not objective, that it's about interpretation and selection of facts, that essentially the historian is sort of both a spokesperson as well as a product of the society she lives in, and that it's about interaction and dialogue. And I think data science can learn from that kind of perspective to not see it as this really objective thing, oh, but the data tells me that. But actually to say, to see it as a dialogue, to actually say, well, my analysis of the data or my interpretation of the data says X and Y, not just, well, the data says this, so it must be true. Um, and I think the second point I want to make is around how we collect data. Um, I think we've got to pay attention to what happens before a data set even exists and sort of ask those questions of why does this data set exist and not this other one? Um, whose voices are being included and whose voices are being excluded? because the production of data set is not a neutral process. It's a very political process. Um, it's something that doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's sort of, it's a product of time, society, location, all those things. Um, and I think in South Africa, given, given our history of oppression, I think it's really important to think about that, like whose voices are in this data set and whose voices are not, not even in here. So that's kind of the two points I make about that. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I think it's you know it's a pity that we haven't got to the point where we, we have a package called ethics that we can just uh, <laughs> go on and go there. Although that deeper package, I think probably it's probably the closest we've got to something. Um, so in, in in industry itself, the um, one often wonders whether we're reaching a point where we're possibly losing trust. Um, with the systems that we have and you know recently Google's um, disbanded the, the ethics advisory committee that they tried to put together it, about 10 days ago they announced it and then yesterday they said they were disbanding it and that was because there were protests around who they had invited to sit on this panel to discuss uh, questions around ethics and the use of data and AI technologies um, and that touched on a whole range of things and um, it, it also it also touches on on, on, the, on the aspect that when you talk about ethics, there are a lot of perspectives, and when you're dealing with big systems, uh, Facebook and Google, you you're talking across you're talking about a set of global ethics as well, which I think is a very difficult thing to try and maintain and understand. And some of the the, the worries are also around use of technology that's developed in the military, for instance. And so in Google's case, someone on the board had had a position with a drone company then, and they were developing uh, image recognition technology for, for that company. So I think, I think it's a fascinating topic at the moment and, and there's, there's, there's a lot of depth to, to the problems that we need to solve um, going forward. Um, I'd like to just open it up to the audience though because we don't have much time and I'm sure people have questions. So if you have a question that you want to pose to the panel, now's a good time. Um, shall I, we try using this wall? Because no one has tried it yet, so I'm going to attempt to throw it to you. But in the front, you may want to say. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nice well, foam wall, and it's not going to hurt anyone. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that was hard. Uh, cool, thanks. Um, hi, so one of the sort of um, more, not uh, human aspects, but data um, protection uh, aspects that I've sort of come across is, is web scraping. So I enjoy web scraping a lot. <laughs> it's one of the things that I find uh, very stimulating. So the question is, what is public data? Um, so, you know, a lot of people like to always point out uh, whenever you go to, let's use a random site like Gumtree, they always have somewhere in their terms and conditions, you're not allowed to elect to, like, uh, automatically collect or web scrape. But it would seem that, you know, some of these sites have, have become almost like a standard, um, you know, uh, code of conduct that they just put up there. You know, so I've seen a lot of people com start complaining that a lot of data science users, just because you can, you shouldn't. You know, but my, my argument is that if it's publicly available and it's put out there, then it can be used. You know, so what, uh, what do you think about that kind of uh, part of what we do? Does anyone want to take that? Or specifically? You can have a go. I'll let you start. Since you have an answer. I just find it interesting what you said because I've thought about that quite a lot in journalism. So I started with my career in journalism and it was just when social media was starting to be a thing. So the media does the same thing. It's the sense of, okay, now my my mom was killed in a horrific way, but she's, she got trampled by an elephant, so this weird story. Now they think it's, it's fair use to go to my Facebook page because it's open and you can steal all my family pictures. So I think there's, a similar, there's similar issues in other fields where, is that data public? Like, I always felt very uncomfortable if you start you know, searching on Facebook, like say for people if there's some um, massive sort of tsunami or something, then you start searching for some Africans and you look for their pictures. And I don't know if that's fair. Like, I always, and how would I feel if someone just did that without permission? So I think there's like these conversations we can probably have between different fields. That's not just a data science question. So I don't have the answer to that because with journalism, there hasn't really been any repercussions. You can take, and maybe this leads to sort of a question, should there be some sort of data ethics body and panel, like with the media, you can take people to the press council. I actually think there's probably a lot that data science learn from the media in that way, should there be, like I say, some sort of panel that I could go to? I don't know if Poppy is going to set stuff like that up. I think they are, but it will be a question of does it get used and does it really have teeth? No, so I think my, my, sorry, my big question is, so, so personal data is personal data. So let's, you know, personal data is off limits. I'm more, more talking about, you know, other alternative data sources generated out of the process of the business that I've actually made available. You know, ratings of restaurants. You know, if you're not going scraping the details of the people that have left that, you know, comment, you know, they, where, where do you draw the line? I think is the. You know. <laughs> I definitely can't, can't answer the question of where you draw the line. <laughs> no idea. Um, but it does seem like. A lot of the problem with this situation is something that looks superficially innocuous can quickly turn less innocuous. Like an example that somebody gave to me was um, somebody was just tracking genuinely public data that they had every right to collect, but on a large scale. And I had a lot of um, geotag and tag information, like it might have been photos or something, I can't even remember the source, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, but by keeping track of a few agents who were known to be uh, regular users of prostitution, they identified the location of a whole bunch of brothels around town. From correlating that with the behaviour of other agents who were then posting things that were geotagged with that location, the people who had published it, well, had done all this, had managed to work out an entire um, connection, like a whole network of people who are frequenting these brothels. And none of this stuff is listed anywhere. It's all there in the public data, but only if you draw all the connections. And mm -hmm. I feel like the question, like, I feel like, personally, if you've got to that point, it's time to throw away the data. Or at least I feel like I, if I've done that, I've crossed a huge boundary. There is no way I'm ever making that public. But the question of exactly where 
At what point in that process did that become problematic? Um, all the information is there, it's just that once you put it together, it becomes a problem. And so it reminds me a lot of problems that, they, that come up, and I know that in other fields this has been discussed, but issues with data linkage. And so if you put together a big medical grant that's about data linkage across multiple sources, they have, at least in Australia, there are some fairly stringent rules about exactly who's allowed to access it, exactly who's allowed to connect one thing to another because of this background awareness that, yeah, the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts and sometimes in a really dangerous way, which I realise is a way of just restating the problem, um, but I feel like that's the, the point at which you start feeling like there's an emergent and potentially dangerous thing that's arisen from that public source is the point where I start getting worried. <laughs> Can I say something about so two things. I would say one on your exact point about web scraping. If it's in the public domain, it's fair game. If you if you kind of comment of oh no, you can't automate the process of uh, retrieving this data, but I can write it down with a pencil. Is is that automation? I mean, like, what are we going to define as the automation technology? It feels like in a court of law, they put it in the public domain. People are going to always act in a predatorial way. Whatever, it's fine. I mean, for me, the bigger thing is on on a, on a long enough timeline. Let's say. We in this like exponential age of data. Right, five years from now we're gonna go, ha ha, look, five years ago a spark could only do like a trillion rows a second. Now it can do, you know, a hundred trillion. How did we ever survive? Um, and so <clears throat> if you step out of all natural data sources that exist, we've got this, uh, I like the term data link, we've got all these available public sources. On a long enough timeline, people are gonna start to put them together and put them to different kinds of uses, right? Do you create the impetus for the right use of public data? Will the good outweigh the bad? I mean, for me, that's the bigger question because you can't really stop people from using whatever technologies are available at them to exploit the system. So if I'm a Somalian sea pirate, um, I would know that I can go onto uh, myshippinglanes.com and see the location of all the ships around the world at any given point in time. I can you know, really time how I go out there. I've used it in completely the wrong way, but again, the onus is then on the shipping people. So, well, maybe we should like, block all the data in this particular channel because we know it will be used for that. So, um, I don't know, it feels like there's always lots of stakeholders in these equations, right? So, like, can the good outweigh the bad in the end game, where actually all data and everything is ultimately available unless people have gone to the measures themselves to make that data unavailable, right? Hmm. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's been said. Okay. Um, okay, is there are there any other questions? Oh, so you want to throw it to me? <laughs> 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 yeah, so just just to carry on from, from that point that you're saying, um, you know what data privacy, are we, are we not sort of trying to close the barn doors from the hostility bolted? Uh, especially in the age we are now where people want uh, automated uh, solutions, people want convenience, people want to be told what they like, you know, and I don't know that, but they respond to that. And you can go a bit further into copy. <coughs> um, you know, this whole tip, sorry, this whole telemarketing industry, um, wouldn't actually exist if it wasn't back to the main. Um, and part of the, I know myself, there's, I've been frustrated with why you calling me, but I've also taken up a few of those products as well, you know, when they when they relevant. <laughs> um, I have, and they've saved me time. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess it's back to that question of where do we draw the line, but is, is that something that we should be thinking about? <laughs> I think I've got a nice use case for this, which is if you look at um, the question for me is what liberties are you willing to forego, right, in exchange for convenience, right? So for someone to dictate to you how best to uh, live your life so you can be as healthy as humanly possible, right, as an example. Or uh, let's say, for example, if you're in China, uh, we want to make sure that you're so healthy you don't dare cross the road, so we're going to shame people who cross the road by taking pictures of them and putting them up in the public domain, right? Um, so like China is a good example of what happens is you start to push the boundaries into society really, really far, right? And I think um, the kind of uh, example that I really like for this, okay, this is a terrible sequence of words I'm about to use, but let it get to the end of the sentence. 
Um, it's all like pornography, right? Difficult to define, but you know it when you see it, right? And I think for different societies, it's different, right? So if you take China, for example, a lot of people they are very comfortable giving up their, li their liberties because they actually have very few liberties to start with, and this is just making life better for them. Um, in a Western world, we've got a lot of liberties. I don't want a random person phoning me selling me a product I probably need. Um, you know, like, that's, 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 by the way, hang up and then go onto their website and just go back and buy the product that way. That, that's how you fix the problem. Yeah, but I mean, I, that's, that's a question, right? And I think every society is different. So the idea of having a global ethics board, I don't think it makes sense either because um, everyone's standard, everyone's line in the sand is a little bit different, but it's society's responsibility to push back when, when the boundary is crossed and have a mechanism with which to push back through, right? Um, so I think that someone like contacting you and saying, I've got this product for you, it depends where it came from. Like when I make a contract with a particular company, I'm signing up that they can use my data in a certain way. But I'm not signing up that they can use my data to sell onto another company that can then use try and solicit to talk, contact you for other products, right? And I want them to use it in a in an ethical way and in a in a proper manner. So if I'm if I'm putting my data on Facebook, sure it's public. But there was a while ago where Facebook was giving people just positive sentiment. So they were they were bombarding your, your stream with positive information, right? And then they noticed they ran an experiment. So they ran an experiment on Facebook users without them knowing. And they said, okay, we're gonna bombard you with more positive news, and then those people actually gave positive news. Those who had negative news, suddenly they started putting out negative news. So I think it's how they use the data. When I sign a contract with a particular company, I'm ex I have an expectation that they're gonna use it in a certain way. And this is going outside of the bounds of what they should be using, how they should be using it. And I think that's where the pushback needs to come. That now I need to say that that's not what I signed up for. I didn't sign up for you using it that way. I think one of the issues is just how free, how hard it is to detect when you've given up your data. Mm -hmm. um, it's as you, so I can't remember who mentioned, it, you tick the box, I agree, without reading screens of information, and suddenly you don't own your own data anymore. It almost, to me, it's, you almost need these days to go to any website and says, do you accept these cookies? Um, and yes or no. Um, they almost need something very explicit like that to say, I'm giving up my, my right to my own data here. Mm -hmm. um, because every day, if you install some software, you do anything, you buy anything, you tick a tick box, says, I agree. Um, nobody has time to read those things. Um, and probably even if you did, you wouldn't find the bit Explicitly, because you skim reading, which says I give up everything. Would it stop you from using Twitter? No, because I know that I'm giving up my data there. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I know what I'm doing, I'm broadcasting. Can I? So, just on that note, there is some discussions that I've heard that where they are thinking about making free products where there's a price attached to it, so that you can say, I don't want my data to be publicly. Uh, so I will pay $2 a month or whatever to make sure that my data is not used in that manner. Okay. Um, so maybe there is some things that can be done and that's why these discussions are important. I think it's, there is some things that can be done by these companies that people will opt into to say, because you just tick a box, right? Yeah. You, you're not allowed to say Actually, you either opt into the service, I want Facebook, or mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to put my data out there in public, I don't want to tick this box. But then you don't get that service. So here's a method that they could offer where you can pay, but your data is not used in manners that are not explicit. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think it's almost out of time, unfortunately. So it's quite a short session. I'm sure there are lots of other questions people have, and I'm sure that people on the panel will be welcome to discuss them further with you. Um, I do agree, though. I think as a as a as a group, as a community of people, um, just like you mentioned with the media, we, we have to at least take ethical issues seriously, because if we don't, we will get regulated. 
and um, that, that might not be a very pleasant space to be in. It's going to add a lot of extra red tape, a lot of extra liability to people working in the field. And um, I think we do have a responsibility to start understanding um, the part that we play um, using data to, to, uh, in the systems that we do. So, um, shall I close off? Thank you. So, uh, okay, thanks, thanks very much to the panel. It was great having you guys here, and uh, I hope that uh, leads you some food for thought. Thanks. Everybody.